Hello and welcome to our first edition of our New South Wales Rugby League Referees Life Member Series. We're going to bring you this series over the next couple of weeks to keep you entertained with some of the stories from our life members both on and off the field. If you don't know me, my name's Daniel Lutringer and I have a graded number of one double double, oh sorry, one double zero seven. Today we've been fortunate enough to be joined by someone who I call a mentor and a great friend, uh, graded member number 742, Ian Partaby. How are you, Ian? Hello, Daniel. How are you, I'm Ian? Well, thank you. I'm well. Um, uh, hello. Uh, I'm well in these uh, very clustered and dislocated times, but other than that, we're all okay. They are very strange times indeed. What are you doing in these times to keep yourself busy and keep keep a smile on your dial? Yeah, a smile on your dial. Well, um, I'm fortunate that I still um, am, am able to work, even though I retired from my uh, previous employment uh, some uh, six years ago uh, as a as a high school teacher. I, um, I I consult with schools and so forth, so I'm fortunate that I can still get out. I'm I'm regarded as an essential worker. Uh, keep reminding my wife that sort of emphasis on essential. Every job um, essential these days. Yeah, uh, it sure is. And uh, we, uh, I'm out every few, uh, uh, a few days a week, and sort of come back and annoy her uh, and so forth. And I think that's what's going to be happening for, unfortunately, the next six months or thereabouts. But now we're we're keeping well, um, communicating with our family by all these technological means, and learning a lot more about technology as time goes on. I must say, I'm very impressed with. Uh... The general public and the people I've liaised with in terms of building their skill set around Zoom and Google Meets, all of these things we haven't heard of before. Yeah, well, you you being a current teacher, and I, and I guess I still get into schools, and um, we're seeing exactly sort of what's uh, being embraced and and what is needed to be done. And and you're right, the speed of adoption of these things. Uh, has sort of taken off at exponential speed. Um, I'm not sure if that's where things will end up when we get back to, in inverted commas, normal. But uh, it's amazing sort of how we can be uh, rather inventive when the, when the need does arise. I think from our point of view, we even saw we had a, a, a video conference last night for Parramatta referees and we even got Max Dunn to get up on, on Zoom and, and contribute, which was pleasing to see. Yeah, that was through um, about 40 minutes tuition prior to the uh, the broadcast or live streaming, I think is the brand new term. And uh, also talking to him uh, on the phone and and uh, walking him through to press this button and that button. So yes, uh, Max, uh, Max is probably a, a step or two behind me. That's uh, in terms of un understanding technology. So, Maybe yeah, you can. Maybe you can drink, uh, teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, yeah, all right. We'll leave that to, for people to work out. With. <laughs> who's, the, who's the old dog there? Um, <laughs> all right, before we start talking about your, your refereeing, um, you mentioned your career in schools. For those of you who don't know, you were a school principal? I was, yes. Uh, yeah, at Bosley Park High School, which uh, is sort of out in the... the uh, southwestern part of Sydney. Um, I guess if you know where the equestrian events were for uh, the 2000 Olympics, not too far from there, um, out sort of uh, about 20 minutes drive out of Fairfield, so in the newer areas. And yeah, I was uh, principal there for 13 years and a great spot. Lucky to work with and for a lot of good people. Okay. All right, let's start by going all the way back to the beginning. Why did you decide to take up the whistle and how did this take place? Now, I better just say this this uh, photo doesn't do you justice. You didn't start in the uh, black and white era of rugby league. Uh, you were uh, starting your refereeing career a lot later on than that. Uh, and in fact, that uh, Channel 7 logo, I remember very well. I think I've still got a copy or one of those jumpers um, was red. And it's amazing, every time it gets washed, it seems to get smaller, like a lot of my other clothes since I've given up. So 
I, I've got to have a word to my wife about that. She's putting too much in the... Um, yeah, well, it was a bit of a challenge, actually. Um, um, back in uh, the time before I took up refereeing, I was challenged by my younger brother, who subsequently um, gained executive status and, and is a, an active member of the Balmain Association. He, um, he asked me if, if uh, I would accompany him into Phillip Street. And for those older people amongst us, uh, they all know what Phillip Street means. Phillip Street in the street in the city. That was the only way you could get a referee's ticket back in the in the uh, the eighties and such, where well, you had there were ten classes, um, and then effectively, when you thought you were ready, you had to go back in there and sit an actual test, the practical test, where they put you over a board, where we had uh, some notable people and. Uh, um, people like uh, Reg Dick, Cole Pierce, Don McDonald, uh, Graham West, um, those sort of people who are iconic back in those days in the refereeing side of uh, things, they'd put you through and uh, you had to pass that test to uh, then get you what you called your ticket, your little ticket. Then, um, one of the many topics we have when we all get together and talk footy is that Paul, my younger brother, often reminds me that uh, the night we both decided we were going to sit for the test, uh, he passed and I failed. And, Is that uh, right? Yeah. Um, he got the junior ticket and I was going from the senior ticket. I think it was a bit more strenuous. Well, that's my defence anyway. <laughs> forget about, forget about um, all the questions I got wrong. But that gave me a little bit of a, a spurt. And Daniel, you know me fairly well. Uh, I'm a bit of a stickler for the rules and understanding them. And I've long had an association that way. I vowed that um, when I did get my ticket, and I did get it the second time around, um, that I was never going to be caught out on sort of rulings and that uh, in the, sometime in the future. So that really stung me into action. Paul took up refereeing in, uh, in Balmain, um, where he still lives. And uh, I was fortunate to join uh, Parramatta. And uh, that was back in the days where Ian McCall was our president. Was that Amen. purely? Was that sorry? Was that purely geographical? Did you end up? Yeah, yeah, in Parramatta? purely geographic. Yeah, I still still live in the Parramatta district. Have have done from for many football seasons, and uh, yeah, I joined the local association. And, uh, I uh, I recall my first game at McCready Park. I was a big goalpost for those people that don't know Sydney all that well. Guildford. Um, yeah, down at Guildford. Okay. So that's how I sort of got into it, and. Uh, yeah, been lots of up, 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 ups, a few down, down, downs, and some of them been pretty deep, as we all know. But um, something that I'm I'm forever grateful that I've been involved with. So you're graded member 742. Can you tell us a little bit about your story from coming to Parramatta, coming into grade, and then making your first grade debut in 1990? Yes, well, I was fairly lucky. Um, I, I got graded back in those days, generally a, a group of people um, got graded. You sort of went through junior reps and all those sorts of things. Uh, I didn't do a, a lot of those, but they had a whole lot of um, uh, trials and I was fortunate enough to, to get graded. And uh, uh, back in those days, it was first grade, reserve grade and under 23s. And I, um, I guess my, my first break came in my, in my first season. I, I recall we were flying to Canberra and Barry Barnes was the first grade referee. And uh, we had a really rough flight into, uh, into Canberra, even though it was only about 20 or 30 minutes in, uh, to fly in. The, uh, Barry got a bad case of air sickness. And uh, fairly quickly, had to, they had to reshuffle um, everybody's appointment. And uh, I was chosen out of the people. I was, I was appointed that day to do the under-23s line. And uh, um, the, the then board, appointments board person said, uh, Pana, you're in the centre. Now, that was great, but there was only one particular problem. Um, on that particular day, uh, they lost my gear at uh, 
at Canberra Airport. I, I remember it well. And uh, we uh, um, were madly searching for, for some gear and a few locals, referees were there and I had to borrow their gear and we were getting dressed to go out. Um, a couple of minutes before the game was due to start, knock on the back door of um, the old Seaford Oval in Canberra and uh, the courier turned up with my gear. So I'd run out with uh, the New South Wales TNT gear on top. I think I had a pair of Canberra shorts and I borrowed, uh, I think, the, the Raiders socks. So I looked, uh, looked a nice old picture. Um, and uh, we, uh, that, was my, that was my first game. And I was fortunate enough to, from then on, on to, um, in, in, in a few cases, sort of, stay in in the center i i ran very few lines uh, so now we all have run. lucky breaks and i've seen I, you I, run, sorry i've seen you run lines since at Parramatta. Uh, you used the word run loosely <coughs> <coughs> i was i was going to correct you on that um so i, I think i got across uh, i got up over five kilometers an hour the day i had the turbo wheelchair but um yeah you're right running is, is a relative turn, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, it was something that um, when I, uh, when we first went into grade, you know, as a higher level, as you would understand, and all, all the members who have been there would understand, and uh, being in the centre was the pinnacle. Um, but I always regarded myself as um, just the fellow next door. Um, and I just happened to be in the right spot at some times when, People wanted somebody to blow a whistle on. So uh, that's sort of how it all started. That's where I got to. And then, uh, yeah, in, into first grade, uh, we, um, back, back in sort of 1990, I had a whisper a few weeks before I was appointed that um, you keep going the way you are and you know, things will work out for you. Um, but again, you know, whilst I wanted to referee and be in the centre and Enjoy, enjoyed the company of all the other people you get when you sort of get into grade from different districts. That, um, you know, I, I was happy, but I was pushing um, and uh, wanting to sort of go further. And uh, I, re I remember getting a phone call from um, the then referees director. I was teaching at Birong Boys High School at that stage. And it was, it was at lunchtime. I remember getting a phone call um, from Dennis and uh, he said, oh, I've got some news for you. And I said, oh, hello, what's going on? Boss ringing. And he, he indicated that I'd been promoted to first grade um, for that week. Uh, that was uh, uh, on a Tuesday, I think, so back before email days and all that sort of thing. He said, oh, I'll ring you later in the week. We'll have a bit of a chat. I was then going off into an economics class. So a business studies, economics, and uh, a computer studies teacher. And uh, I think that's all we talked about with the boys because they were obviously dead keen to have a chat. And you know, one of them said to me, you, you seem fairly happy chappy, sir. What's going on? And I just said, oh, this is what I've just been told. And this is what's happening. And uh, I walked back into the staff room after that and I thought she wasn't too much, there was, uh, not a lot of economics taught there. and. Uh, some of the some of the boys actually ended up going to the uh, that game um, on the, on that week when I, I was appointed and made a made a big effort to let everybody know that that's my economics teacher out there. Okay. So uh, yeah, G good times. I, I remember it very well. We touched on family, the Sorry, whole family with it, and and uh, I just quickly got away from them because you know we all situations like that we all want to get out and get ourselves prepared so that game was 1990 it was st george versus the gold coast, gold coast seagulls yeah uh, what were your memories of the game as such uh daniel in my mind i was ready for first grade as i said some weeks before because back in those days you had to stand by you had to sit down on the sideline and you watched the Annesleys, the McCullums, the Harrigans running around and you think, well, I can do this. 
you know, it's, it's all right, I can do this. So um, I was fairly confident that um, once I got the call that I'd be okay. I remember being out there for the first 10 minutes and looking up at the clock down there and I thought, oh, that's obviously broken. <laughs> that's no way we've been out here 10 minutes. And then I remember looking again a few minutes later and it progressed to about 13 and I thought, wow, it's a whole different ball game out there. Very physical, very tough. Um, there, there are times where you hear the moans and groans of uh, sort of the tackles and you think, geez, I'm glad I haven't got the ball in my hand. Fast, furious, and you know, the players in the heat of the moment used to give you a fair bit of hurry up. And they all knew this was my first game. I, I can recall a few of them having a comment. I don't worry, he's a rookie, you know, he'll get it right someday. And, um, a very proud moment, but um, you're out there alone, and that was the big thing that struck me. I think that the speed and the aloneness—that's bad grammar, I guess—but the aloneness of um, sort of what uh, what you're doing, particularly but, without um, comms in those days. Yes, yeah, yeah. You had to rely a lot on your touchies and, and uh, they being in the right spot and. Uh, and there was a lot more expectation in terms of our movement around the field, even though it was in a, um, the, the five metre rule back in those days, but we, you know, we had to referee at seven and eight metres. Uh, there was a lot more expectation. Looking, uh, at then. looking at vision too, there was a lot of refereeing from the ruck and then refereeing from the five metres. Yes, you, you were expected to be over the ruck. Um, at, uh, on certain um, occasions, uh, like today, they have lots of indicators of what um, what sort of things are expected of you. And if there was a, a ruck that needed your attention and you weren't there, uh, that was something that was uh, in the debrief and they were quite torturous sometimes. And they were uh, being diplomatic back in those days, the, the appointments board and, and the people in charge used to give it to you fairly bluntly. Um, this wasn't accepted or this wasn't good enough and you should have been there and you should have done this and, and so forth. But um, well, the game, yeah, very physical. Very, very physical. That might be a good time. Um, I gave you these questions beforehand, some of them to have a look at, but question without notice. We've just seen a couple of times on the vision there at the kickoff, you've had this quirky sort of shoulder tap when the uh, camera's panned onto you. Is there a story behind that? Yep. One that got me into trouble one day too. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was asked why and then told not to do it again. And being the uh, the rebel I was on lots of occasions, I thought, well, I'm going out there next week. They can't sack me until the 80 minutes is up. So I, I did it again and no one mentioned anything. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, as I said a little earlier, I always regarded myself just as, you know, and there was a profile attached with the role that I was in. Um, probably not, obviously not as much as some others were getting, but I always regard as a team effort. Um, I was a bit of a, a nomad in my um, work life back in those days. I lived in Sydney, I worked in Maitland, travelled to and from Sydney three or four times a week, wore out a, um, a Toyota control, uh, Corolla in about the first month, brand new one. and that was my little my little symbol um to my family that uh, we're all out there together and uh and a bit of a thank you um to them so there's a, a lot of sacrifices to um to be made by them to allow me to do something that i was very keen to to be involved in um and on, on the odd occasion when I was on TV, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd obviously gather around and uh, want to uh, watch what was going on. And my, my wife's got a really funny story of our, our son on one particular day was sitting in front of the TV when the game was about to kick off. And again, my wife said to young Stuart, um, move, I want to see your father. 
And he just turned around and said, why? You'll see him when he gets home. You know, so I know I drifted away a little bit there. But, yeah, it, um, it, it was a, a team effort. And uh, I was highly appreciative of the sacrifices they made to allow me to do this. And, and, and they still make sacrifices today because I'm heavily involved um, in, in the district association. Now, I've got, I've got some footage I've uh, found here. If we do go back in 2020 in some capacity, State of Origin is uh, meant to be heading to Adelaide for the first time ever. But you actually refereed the first first grade game in Adelaide. Can you tell us a little bit about that between St George and Balmain? Yeah. Um, a, a great appointment. And I guess if someone was to say, you know, what well, highlights and so forth, um, rugby league in, in Adelaide was... Uh, um, a bit of a no-no, sort of, and it was the old Adelaide Oval. They actually closed the gates that night, it was, um, and uh, it was um, a lot of hoo-ha for the week. We were we were down down in Adelaide for four or five um, days. Um, Cole White and uh, Brian Bonney were the touch judges, and we had some media commitments, obviously promoting the game and uh, and so forth. Uh, I and, and uh, my wife actually was able to come down um, with me at that particular point. Uh, I think she was more making sure that the three fellas wouldn't go out and um, paint the town red. But it, it was funny, uh, Balmain and St George in the game, as, we, as you can see, and, and as you said, they got us to do some clinics and um, uh, do some refereeing down there because uh, rugby league was quite a fledgling and made up of uh, sport and made up a lot of expats. And the match of the day at one of the local ovals was against two sides that had exactly the same colours. And you wouldn't believe it, the result ended up the same. Same score, same result. Um, quite quite coincidental. So uh, there's Cole White just as we talk. Um, and uh, yeah, great honour. Um, and the, the thing that sticks in my mind was that uh, when we were walking off up through the crowd, we're actually being applauded. Um, great job, refs, great job, or umps, so I think they might have called us and so forth. So um, very rare experience on the field and, and certainly off the field. So um, well, that, that is quite rare. Honor. Yeah, that's quite rare, quite rare to get <laughs> clapped off, so to speak. Uh, you mm. became a life member of the New South Wales Referees Association in 1996. Can you tell us a little bit about what this recognition meant to you? Oh, well, you hear, you hear all the time, peer recognition is the best form of recognition. And, and, and to get that um, in any form, but um, I still regard New South Wales Referees Association um, as a pinnacle body. And, and to receive such a nomination and, and to be awarded that um, is uh, um, quite esteemed in my mind. Uh, I, I, uh, I was fortunate, um, Daniel, I, I, I was lucky. Refereeing I see is, um, is something that um, I think paralleled my, my full-time working life in teaching where you had a lot of um, personnel issues, um, be they students, um, teachers, or um, or parents, and it was the same sort of thing. And where you had a week or whatever at the, at school to sort of sort things out, you've you've got eighty minutes or less than there on the field. So I, I felt sort of a a lot of paralleling between the two the two jobs in the inverted commas, but I, I was I. Obviously, my full-time work was education, and I felt that uh, right throughout my refereeing career, even from day one, my that day I was uh, down at McCready Park, that the refereeing fraternity really were out there by themselves and didn't have a lot of support. So I had a lot of um, interest in training and development, which again, fairly uh, we call it professional learning and teaching these days. But I felt that uh, as referees, we could have done with a lot of um, training and development. A lot of times you were just appointed, assessed on how you went. Um, and I just felt there were a lot of things um, I got interested in 
And I think those sorts of things contributed to me gaining life membership because the, the association at that stage was very, very progressive. Um, our chairman was Ian McCall and he, we were just entering into, I'd call semi-semi-professional um, uh, refereeing where uh, TNT had come on, on board and offered very big dollars. And uh, I managed to um, have a word to Ian about sort of the development of the modified games and um, you know, floated concepts about video assistance and all that sort of thing. That, that were the sorts of things I dabbled in and did so when we came back uh, when Super League and the ARL joined into the NRL. Uh, I was fortunate that I had was quite central there. But I think that's what contributed to me gaining life membership uh, of New South Wales, uh, the off-field activities. And I felt I was just giving back what I'd been given. Um, be it at Parramatta or New South Wales. You know, plenty of those people have done that before and continue to do it and will do it in the future. You touched on the um, coaching and development side of things. Nowadays, you're still heavily involved in the Parramatta Referees Association. How have you found working at the coalface, at the grassroots, and what are a few of the things you've been doing? Uh, look, it, it's h highly rewarding. Um, and um, for those that are aware, I was I was quite central to the development of um, the modified games, the mini games, and, and the mod games. So, you know, where, as I said a little earlier, um, I, was, I was quite central to that development. I don't mind saying that um, we we did a lot of uh, work on that, and I now that's transposed to, I guess, where my passion is at Parramatta. Um, the newbies, as we affectionately call them, I, I sort of have current and have had for the last few years sort of um, a little bit of uh, influence on them and, and you see people go through. And uh, whilst it wasn't in mini and mod, but people like yourself and a few others that have been recently graded, um, Ben McMurray, um, you know, Tom Camborn, uh, go back to Gavin Reynolds and, and Ashley Klein, and there's many others and I have um, uh, those that I've left out aren't too offended, but you see people develop, and in many ways it, it's, it's similar to sort of parenting. You see the the children sort of in inverted commas grow up and sort of progress, and you get a lot of satisfaction out of out of seeing these people develop, and not necessarily people that get to the top like uh, yourselves, but you see some of these other people that um, um, have their own little milestones in the district, yeah. Um, Recently, we had a young girl who turned up for a first game at a park and then froze five minutes before the game was due to start. And we coaxed her onto the field. And now, I think, uh, as soon as she's finished the last game on Saturday, she's going home and putting seven black crosses on the calendar in preparation for anticipation for, for next week. So you get a lot of satisfaction. But again, I just see that I'm doing what others have done for me in the past. And as I said a few seconds ago, um, others will continue doing as we, uh, we go through um, the district and go through time. Now it's more of a family affair. I've got my older brother been involved for the last few years. Um, that's sort of a fairly bonding type of process, I, I guess. And, um, and he's enjoying it. And it's good to see him uh, involved as well. Might be a, a Personal question, don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Another one without notice. Have you found that that brought you two closer together or you two always been strong or it's just opened up the everyday lines of communication a bit more? Or? It, it gives us something else to fight about, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Neil, like myself, is fairly strong-willed. Um, and uh, But, yeah, it has brought us closer together. We, we obviously see each other more regularly. Um, um, we've got a common language to talk about. Um, we had quite divergent um, working lives, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just good. I, I think it's uh, sort of brought brought us closer, you know. And with Paul, um, the, the three of us, uh, when we do get together, we do uh, after about ten seconds of talking footy somewhere along the line. And uh, 
the three of us has solved the world's problems that many times. We've, we've had our discussions with it. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Um, Parramatta, I'm giving back to Parramatta what Parramatta's given to me. They were the ones that kicked me off on this particular path. And uh, I just hope others, you know, in the future will, will do the same. I'm sure they will. It's a very strong association, as we all know. But, you know um, it's, it's been something that um, uh, I could recommend to anybody to be involved in. Officiating is, is very important, I think. So um, before we head into a, a segment we're going to do to finish a fast five, either or, um, I'm going to ask all of our life members, and you've already touched on it throughout our interview, um, I think it's a good time to reflect when we're away from the footy field at the moment, what actually drives us and, and why do we referee? Why do we take up the whistle and what benefits we have gained? Can you tell me probably the biggest thing for you that you've taken from refereeing or refereeing has given you throughout your time in refereeing, be it on field or off field or a combination of both? I'm quite a competitive person. Um, Inwardly so. Um, I mightn't show that sort of in my everyday life, but I certainly have set myself many, many personal levels, benchmarks, goals, and uh, I feel the expression of um, where rugby league refereeing has taken me has allowed me to set those sorts of particular goals. And, uh, and, Fortunately, I've been able to achieve most of those. So I think what, what it's taught me or has allowed me to do is to be able to be inwardly competitive, uh, measure my level of success, and success doesn't necessarily mean reaching first grade or beyond. Uh, it's, uh, it's giving me something else to contribute to um, society, especially more so lately uh, in the last few years. And uh, it, it, it's given me another perspective where um, I'm, I now have responsibilities for other people and, uh, and I'm endeavouring to make sure that I fulfil I fulfill those particular responsibilities by getting in and, and uh, giving it all I can and assisting sort of the development of individuals as well. All right, now we've got our Fast five just to finish off and either either, uh, something a little bit different. Uh, barbecue or tomato sauce? Oh, barbecue. Uh, Ford or Holden? We won't be able to say that anymore. Um, football, meat pies and kangaroos and Holden cars. Yeah, that's good. what I threw that one in well, didn't I? Good, good man, good man. Always been a Holden man. Uh, state of origin or grand final? Um, been involved in both. Um, or, you, of course, were you were video referee in the grand yes, final? Uh, yes. Yeah, and, and origin? And, yes. Yep. Um, or, oh, gee. Um, Let's go from an entertainment point of view. Yeah, look, I, well, well, certainly ratings and so forth. I'm sure the state of origin, states of origin are the ones that sort of rate there. But um, I, I, I think grand finals. Uh, the yep. build-up um, of work throughout the whole season. Yes. Yeah. State of origin appointments sort of come out of the blue a little bit, whereas you sort of work towards the grand final. And if, you, if you're there, as they say, when the whips are cracking at the end from a, an appointment point of view, uh, yeah, it ha has, that, has that different um, difference about it. And it has that smell, as they say, about the build-up and getting, and getting there. So, yeah, grand final now, I think, about it. Uh, beach or snow? Uh, beach. For sure. fi finally, I don't know how fast these five ended up being. Money or free time? <laughs> um, you probably need money to have the free time. Um, I haven't given someone much thought. Um, I guess my, uh, it's not a preoccupation, but it's fairly important to me. Uh, I think money I'd go for. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you certainly need free time to... Call of the draw, almost fifty-one forty-nine money, I guess. Golden point. Yes. Okay, Ian, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank you to everyone at home for listening in. 
Uh, Ian, you stay safe and look after your family in these times and likewise to everyone else at home. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Oh,